Please join us. Are you here to talk about the Educational Television Network? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so uh, my name is Jess Wilson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Regional Educational Television Network. Um, I'm also today uh, representing the Vermont Access Network, uh, the acronym known as VAN. Um, if you hear me say that later, you'll know what, what that is. So RETN is an educational access uh, cable television channel, and we serve the communities of Chittenden and Addison counties, uh, a part of Addison County. And as I said, we're also a member of the Vermont Access Network, and that's the trade organization that represents Vermont's community media organizations around the state. I want to thank you for the opportunity to just to provide you a brief on uh, what's going on in our industry here in Vermont. Um, there are multiple threats uh, right now to Vermont's cable regulatory authority uh, and as well public educational and government access media organizations like mine. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit today about the value of those community media centers and specifically uh, related to the educational opportunities for learners in our state because I feel that's something your committee um, might uh, care very much about. Um, so I'm going to just give you the very briefest background in history because cable regulation is a little complicated, so <laughs> I'll try to boil it down. Um, but Vermont's authority to require public educational and government, also known as PEG access, uh, franchise fees, and those are the fees that basically support uh, the work that we do. Uh, that authority rests on its ability to manage its public rights of way, and that's enshrined in the Federal Communications Act of 1934 and the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984. Uh, so the Cable Act is a national mandate that requires both regulators and cable operators to encourage the growth of cable systems, respond to community needs, interests, and assure the widest possible diversity of information sources through the regulation of tele uh, television, ca cable television franchise, uh, franchises. So the, the state of Vermont first established PEG access channels as a funding and public policy objective in April 1984. Uh, and it's the Public Utility Commission in our state that provides uh, regulation of that. Um, a little bit about where we are currently, because of um, Vermont's really firm commitment to PEG access and those values, Vermonters are benefiting from a thriving local community media ecosystem that connects our communities together around the state, uh, where there are 25 community media centers, over, over 80 full-time channels, um, we produce 18,000 hours of live public meetings, events, community-based education, free speech forums each year. Um, that basically uh, amounts to $74 million uh, worth of equivalent community services in 2017. And we're doing that uh, with $8.7 million in cable subscriber funding. So that's an $8.7 million investment. Uh, that returns about $74 million. And we employ uh, across the state almost 200 people. Um, and, you know, specifically, uh, what I wanted to share with you today is, is what happens um, at an educational access channel like RETN. And so we provide professional video production coverage to local communities in the form of school board meetings, school events, community concerts, other arts programming, all at little or no cost. Um, and these programs are carried on cable and online and provide a lifeline for residents to connect to local news, decision makers, uh, and events in the community. But perhaps it would be more interest to you is that organizations like ours actually provide learning opportunities for Vermont students and professional development for Vermont educators. <clears throat> now, this work includes hosting video camps, supporting student internships, both high school and college internships. Uh, we provide trainers for teachers to use video in their classroom, uh, which is a great engagement tool for student learning. Um, we provide free or low-cost classes to community members and students at our centers, and we support equipment for video integration uh, into student personalized learning plans. That's been one of the big things we've seen lately is that students using video as part of their PIPs and PLPs, uh, and media literacy training, uh, and much more. And I can't underscore how important media literacy training is uh, in this day and age, for certain. Um, and then a specific example of the work, this work in action, in 2018, RETN completed with Charlotte Central School students, NASA, and the International Space Station, a great project. Uh, the students were given a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to speak directly with astronauts aboard the ISS as part of an interdisciplinary unit on space experiments. School officials called us because they did not have the equipment or expertise to figure out how to connect these students live with the ISS. 
Um, but we were able to do that. Um, and as a result, um, the students talked directly to the, the astronauts on the ISS. And uh, that television show was broadcast live on RETN and on NASA TV for a national or international audience. And we also worked directly uh, with the students to create short videos about their research and experience uh, talking with those astronauts. And there were 22 student videos that came out of that project um, and uh, also a short documentary that we produced about it that we were able to share with the community. And I did include a link in my testimony. If you care to see any of those student videos, they're fantastic. Um, so I know time is short, so I'll get, <laughs> get to the meat of this. There are a lot of threats facing us right, right now uh, in our industry. One is cable cord cutting, which uh, I don't need to say probably too much about, um, uh, but that folks are cutting the cord and that directly affects revenue because the federal government prohibits the state from um, taxing any internet services. So people are moving away from cable and over to internet that has a direct impact. There was a cable revenue reclassification uh, that Comcast uh, took advantage of last year that basically resulted in a $500,000 loss statewide in cable funding revenue. Uh, many of you might be aware that Comcast is also challenging the authority of the Public Utility Commission in federal court right now. There is an ongoing lawsuit about the most recent CPG. Um, and then we also have an FCC rulemaking uh, that's in progress right now that basically uh, would enable cable companies to charge back uh, to local communities, to the franchise fee, anything that they donate so they could consider our channels on the cable system as something that they could charge back. They get to assign whatever value they want. The rulemaking has, it says nothing about the value of these channels. They just get to decide and then charge it back against those franchise fees. And so the big questions that we're really uh, trying to answer right now are how do we preserve the state of Vermont's ability to manage its public rights of way and contracts with the cable providers? And how do we continue to support the public policy objectives of PEG access through uh, our administrative, legislative, and regulatory authority? And uh, we have a couple of things that we're proposing. One is a workshop with the Public Utility Commission to really look at these issues. Uh, that actually um, has just been scheduled, so progress there. In late March, there will be a workshop between those of us in the van community, the department, the PUC, uh, and the cable operators. And then we also are, are working with members of the House and Energy Technology Committee to put forward legislation for a summer study committee. And so my, my big hope for you today uh, is that if we are successful in meeting the crossover deadline, um, that you would consider supporting uh, this summer study committee to really take a deeper look at these issues because we do think that it ha will have a huge impact on you know, our ability to work in the state and, and provide these services. And uh, I'll, I'll wrap up there and take questions if you have them, but I really appreciate your time and consideration this morning. Questions? I, I'm actually curious to know more about cord cutting. Why sure. do people have to cut the cord? Why do people have to cut the cord? They have to pay if they don't cut. Uh, well, cord cutting is really about um, it, uh, basically getting rid of cable television and just having internet service because you can watch all of the TV you want now. Oh, you don't mean actually. Uh, correct, right. Yeah, it's just a... Because I've seen so many cut cable cords, I thought. Yeah. No, it's a it's a it's a term of art to basically describe uh, internet is now really one of the primary ways video is being served. In Vermont, though, we have seen that cord cutting has been a little bit slower because we have uh, an older population. We also don't have, uh, I'm sure you are all very well aware, great broadband in a lot of places. So you you would need cable to be able to watch TV. Um, but it's it's certainly an issue um, that uh, you know within 10 years from now be a lot less folks actually watching TV on cable. It'll just be over internet. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the distinction between um, cable and satellite and internet. Mm. Very good question. Yeah. Yes. So the, the distinction being, while well, there are no franchise fees charged for satellite, uh, there are no fran franchise fees cannot be charged for internet services. Uh, the federal government has said that. So franchise fees that support <coughs> community media channels uh, can only be collected on the cable side of the, the revenue. So uh, if you have a cable provider that does like triple play, which could be phone, internet, and cable, 
revenue to support uh, community media channels uh, in local communities is only collected on that cable side of the bill. And that side is going down. Representative Tooth. Yeah, I guess that goes on to my question because uh, Northwest Access TV in St. Albans, they've done a great job with their, they have a new rebuilding. Um, it's a beautiful building. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, but they do a lot of stuff through Facebook and YouTube. Yes. There's probably not a lot of revenue generating from that bill, is there? Or is that a, there a way to grab that? Um, we're thinking about many ways to, to, um, to find new sources of revenue, um, yeah. you know, from fee for service work. Uh, to we we all of us are putting content online at yeah. RETN um, we've had tremendous success with engagement with our communities around Facebook live yes yeah, so every every school board meeting that we film um, and special community school event we put on Facebook live and and remarkably we've seen wonderful engagement yeah. it's, it's people who really care who are commenting and watching and on Burlington School Board meetings, we'll see upwards of a thousand viewers on Facebook Live. And you can see them live. Who's actually? We actually know. Too, yes. So actually yeah. Know which is great because we just, we yeah. don't know that on our cable channels. Right. Absolutely. So yeah, we're all working very hard to develop new services and new ways to reach our community, and that's really why the study committee uh, is is important because it's going to help all of us think together about what uh, what this looks like in the future. Representative. Do you have any update on that FCC rulemaking? I, I know I um, submitted a letter in support of, I, I'm a GNAT oh, viewer wonderful. down in Manchester. <laughs> yeah. And um, so the latest uh, there, thank you for supporting the letter. And in fact, you can still send letters to the FCC, uh, and we, we're encouraging that. Where it is at right now, the government shut down, uh, slowed down that process a little bit. Okay. But the latest guesses, uh, and, the, and these are just guesses, is that the rule will still come out. Uh, probably in uh, September or October and then there's a 90-day period before it goes into effect um, we believe that on day 91 uh, cable operators will probably take advantage of that rule and, that, and there will be lawsuits but the likelihood and again this is all guess is, is that there will not be a stay while it's fought out in court so there could be up to an 18-month period where funding for these community media channels could be cut estimates as much as 30 to 50 percent and so our, our centers need to find a way to survive uh, during that time period while uh, this is fought out at the federal level and in court what would be the composition of the committee the summer study for Thank you. The, the uh, idea for that, and I'm going to take a look at some notes because I have not been directly involved with uh, all of that, is we're, we're proposing possibly a, a, a series of six meetings uh, that would include uh, members, a legislator from Senate Finance, uh, House and Energy Technology, the Commerce Committees, uh, and then representatives from the Department of Public Service, the PUC, uh, cable operators, uh, internet operators, representatives from our organization, VAN, um, Vermont Leagues and city, city and Towns, the Vermont School Boards Association, and uh, a group that represents the public interest. So trying to, but I think it, it would be about um, two to three legislators potentially um, is, the, is the idea. Thank you. Well, it's really been great to talk to you. Thank you very really much. appreciate yeah. your, Thank you. your time. Thank you. So Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> we are switching gears over to a discussion about what to do when um, colleges, uh, our independent schools, <coughs> appear to be gearing up to close. And we had this introduced last week, correct? introduced last week? Mm -hmm. Did we have Yeah, did Jim, we have Jim came in and introduced it last week. Um, and we have up first Susan Stightley from the Association, Association of Vermont Independent Colleges. So thank you for coming and welcome welcome back. Thank you for having me. I'm still just a little discombobulated at being in Nicaragua, which yeah. was super hot to come back to super cold. <laughs> yeah. um, would you like the draft request up behind you? Or sure. To look at? That would help. Uh, I actually have a copy, so. Okay. Do you all want the. Yeah. 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 For the record, I'm Susan Steigley, the president of the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges, or AVIC. 
just by way of background on this legislation and why this issue came about, um, when Burlington College closed suddenly, um, they left behind their academic records and the Agency of Education had to go in and physically take the files and the records uh, and then respond to students' requests for their transcripts. You know, Burlington College was really an outlier. They closed so suddenly and um, I have to say in a disorganized fashion. Uh, but the agency came in and requested an appropriation to take to manage the records and also requested that private colleges maintain a bond um, in case of closure. That would have really caused a hardship for the small uh, institutions that we have. Bonds are based on financial stability and it could have um, really caused a financial hardship. So we came up with a compromise um, in that AVIC members would maintain a memorandum of understanding. And AVIC stands for? AVIC is the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges. Which is too much of a mouthful. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so AVIC members signed an MOU agreeing that they would um, take care of a member institution's records or ensure that they were taken care of by a third party. That legislation was uh, only when we proposed that, it, we also had proposed a piece if an institution wasn't a member of AVIC, but when the legislation passed, that part got dropped. So the, the problem with the current issue, the current legislation is that if a private college is not a member of AVIC, they're not part of that agreement, we have no control over what they do with their records. Um, and so this, what we're proposing now is an effort to fix that problem and really making it the responsibility of the institution, whether they're a member of AVIC or, or not, uh, that should they be placed on probation by their accrediting agency, that with uh, in five business days, they would notify the agency of education and then within 90 days submit a student, an academic record plan uh, that would need to be approved by the state board of education or the agency. That way it doesn't matter if someone's a, a member or not. And we have been working hard at the, uh, and brought people together at the presidential level and the registrars together to talk about how we all might work together to support each other um, should an institution close. So as a result, the presidents voted on an academic record retention policy um, in November that everyone um, has adopted. And the purpose of the policy is to ensure that all students enrolled in AVIC member institutions have access to their academic records should an institution close. Our preferred course of action is that the AVIC, an AVIC, another AVIC member institution takes on the academic records, but if that's not possible, we acknowledge that a third party vendor experienced in academic record management may need to perform that function. And there are um, third party vendors that, that manage student records and academic records when an institution closes. And actually their fee is very, nominal um, if the depending on the state of the tran the transcripts and whether they're electronic or digital um, so that is definitely an option should another institution not take on um, a, the records um, and it also we also talked about um, what should happen if the your records that are maybe a hundred years old you know that the, the records that need to be preserved are the ones that the students are going to be needing uh, so that things are destroyed in accordance to best practices and we've developed a naming convention so that we're trying to get everybody on the same level playing field for uh, student academic records so that if an institution closes it's they're easily transferable so that everything's electronic that there's naming conventions uh, for how another institution, so that everything lines up um, on, the, on the records. Um, so I feel we've worked really hard to get a, a good record retention policy in place. Again, that does only apply to AVIC members, so if an institution is not an AVIC member, uh, we have no control over what they do. Uh, so that is why this legislation is important in that it puts the burden on the institution, whether they're a member or not, to uh, work with the Agency of Education and the State Board of Education. <coughs> Susan, how many AVIC members are there? There are 14. And how many students in total went to Burlington College at one time or another? In total, I don't have uh, those numbers. Uh -huh. 
I mean, it was a small institution, uh, yeah. but I, over the, the course of how many at like, one time? Uh, I think about 300 to 400 maximum during um, the same day. So 14 or 8 members, how many colleges are non famous? <coughs> NECI is not a member, New England uh, Institute, the Culinary Institute, and Green Mountain College, which is closing, is not a member. That's, those are the only two? Those are the only two, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. there were, I thought there were a couple of other cartoon studies. Oh, yeah. They're not accredited, but yes, yeah, so they're not a member of Okay, also. and there was a, like yeah. some really small one, religious one down. Well, the yeah, state. there is a very small missionary <clears throat> college that's not a member. And then, I mean, it depends on, like, uh, O'Brien School of Cosmology is not a member. So those types of institutions are not members. Who's the accrediting agency? It's NECHI. Yeah. NECHI they, they, is their acronym. It's New England uh, Association <coughs> of Higher Education uh, accreditation, probably. Uh, it used to be uh, NECHI. No, not NECHI. Um, NIESC? Yeah. Yeah. It was NIESC. It was NIESC, and now they go by the acronym of NECHI. But it's the same group. Same group, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why did they do that to well, <laughs> That was cool. Like we, we have enough things to remember. <laughs> So I can only remember the actor, and Nechi is catchy. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to remember. I, in the last biennium, when we took testimony, I only recall the schools that weren't part of AVIC as being like the, you know, sort of Aveda Institutes or whatever they would be considered, the mm -hmm. Cartooning Institute, <clears throat> and maybe it was like Southern Vermont College. It was one of them. There were only several, though. I thought Green Mountain College was in AVIC. Green Mountain was in AVIC, but as their financial situation mm -hmm. got more uh, unstable, they dropped their membership. Okay. So that's one of the issues that, you know, people <coughs> may or may not be in. Um, a member, depending on the circumstances. James? Just to, did Green Mountain drop out because they literally couldn't afford the membership fee, or are there larger reasons that you guys have policies and procedures and guidelines that they were no longer able to meet? So was it just a matter of the fee, or was it a larger? I think it was just a matter of the fee. What is the fee? Uh, it, it's based on the amount of students that they have. And um, so it's sort of a complicated formula, but it's based on uh, the students. So that the larger institutions pay more, and the smaller ones pay less. And they, you know, they had a new president who wasn't in higher ed before, so he was making difficult choices when he first came in, and he didn't really understand what AVIC's role. Sure. That, so there were all there's a lot of factors at play. But the range of the fee is like the range is uh, several thousand dollars up to probably twelve thousand. Questions. Could you describe a little bit more of these third party vendors, <coughs> what they specialize in, and are you know, and how much confidence one can have in them? So, there's a group called Parchment, which is based in Chicago, and that's a group that we have talked with most just to explore the possibility uh, of, if necessary, that the records would go to them. So, they have managed records of other institutions in other states that have closed. Uh, so they take the transcripts, they, if, if, if the records are all electronic, they don't even charge a fee. They just take the transcripts and then they charge students when they ask for their transcripts a minimal fee, I think of $15. Um, that's the only one that I'm really familiar with, and that's probably the one that most likely our, our institutions would use if necessary. And that's only, but they, they also will handle paper records from 50 years ago, or no? They, they, <coughs> they would charge more for that. They would have to scan them uh, and get them into their system. So, so that's one of the things we've been working with, uh, the registrars, is let's get everything scanned in uh, and everything electronic to make it easy as possible to shift the records over. Why would why would another institution be willing to take these records? I think in the uh, because some of the students may go to that institution. So and 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 just because of the partnership amongst the private colleges of wanting to help each other out. But it's more like with Green Mountain College, they made an agreement with Prescott in Arizona to take their student records and their students. Some of the students are going to go to Vermont institutions as well, and they will take those records. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I just did want to say <laughs> that uh, 
the language that we worked on uh, had worked with the previous administration at the agency uh, and their previous council, uh, so we had agreed upon that, but I haven't had a chance to uh, really touch base with Emily on this. Okay. <clears throat> hey Shannon, I'm going to go to my testimony on this, but I think I can handle it. Okay. Hi. Uh, Emily Simmons, Agency of Education General Counsel. I'm going to go back to where we started. I wrote some quick testimony for you, threw it together yesterday. Which would make sense, my Susan and I haven't touched base. I looked at this yesterday. <laughs> So here we go. Um, so thanks for taking this language up. I think, first of all, that this is an important issue. Um, as uh, Susan alluded to, the agency and the state board did work with Green Mountain College last month to have the state board review and approve an agreement with Prescott College in Arizona to be the permanent repository for Green Mountain College's student records going all the way back as far as they have those student records. It's an important note, I thought this morning you might not realize, um, universally, whether it's federal law or state retention policies, I've seen that the requirements to maintain student academic records at the post-secondary and the K-12 level is indefinitely. There's um, a need to keep those records um, available to students should they need them, just normal life activities like getting a new job or another degree. Um, you, all probably have had to access your student academic records from college, <coughs> so you understand. Um, those um, records, so the state has an interest in essentially its consumer <laughs> protection interest in protecting Vermont students' ability to get their money's worth, is the way I would say it, from the uh, degrees that they've received and the coursework that they've completed. So I just I wanted to say thank you for taking this up. Um, I appreciate the intent, like we said, to protect <coughs> students' consumer rights. And also, um, I sense that the agency has an interest in, uh, or the committee has an interest in protecting the agency of education from becoming what I would call the custodian of last resort in the case that the system just totally falls through and we see which we would not like to see another Burlington College incident. That was unfortunate on all fronts. Um, and those records are currently housed at the Agency of Education. We can get into that a little more. Um, so I think that this approach is a good one. A very quick turnaround um, on notice, and then some very clear duties on the closing institution to act really proactively to come up with the plan that the State Board would then approve. Um, I, we appreciate moving away from the AVIC language because as the Green Mountain College sort of scenario demonstrated, it doesn't do the state and the students impacted much good if the membership association that has the duty to protect one another's records um, no longer, for whatever reason, has the closing institution as one of their members. It defeats the purpose. So I, I do think seeking a different policy solution is appropriate. So in order to improve the language that you've got drafted and that you've been looking at, um, I just have four really recommendations to make the language stronger, which that you would consider them. So the first is that the language as you have it drafted now refers only to financial probation from the accrediting institution. We think that it would be more appropriate to um, have the trigger be any kind of probation from the accrediting institution. We have seen, unfortunately, that academic probation is um, sometimes the first indicator that an institution is going to be facing some difficulties, and that, just like financial probation, can lead to that unfortunate cycle of very quickly declining enrollment and the institution having to make a hard decision about closure. So we feel that just probation period would be an appropriate trigger. Five days from that notice of probation, the institution would notify the state board the way you have it currently drafted. The next sort of trigger in the language is that it provides 90 days for the institution that has been placed on probation to get a plan together um, and submit that plan to the state board for approval. The agency feels that a shorter time period would be more appropriate. 90 days is just shy of a semester, and that's, um, for instance, just looking at Green Mountain College, the 
the notice that their board worked with in, a, in advance of closure. So they have announced they'll be closing in July of this year, and they announced that like the second week of January. So if, we don't know if that's typical, but if it is, 60 days um, would have been a more appropriate time limit, and we think still give the institution enough time to seek out a partner or um, follow their records retention policy, as Susan mentioned, and work with the state board to make sure that that is um, enacted according to Section A of Section 175. And then third, we feel that the um, General Assembly should designate some appropriate state government custodian to act as, as I said, the custodian of last resort. Hopefully we will never need a place for the records to go. Hopefully the process where the closing institution is proactive and seeks their own agreement with their own chosen partner to take those academic records. Hopefully that works every time and we never <coughs> need this. But if we were to see a just totally abrupt and um, unforeseen closure as Burlington College unfortunately was, there was no time for this process. Um, that closure effectively happened within a couple of hours. So the five days notice even wouldn't have um, addressed that really unfortunate circumstance. And it is true the Agency of Education sent staff to Burlington College to physically gather up those records. Um, and those records still reside at the Agency of Education in essentially a, a it's not a closet, it's nicer than a closet, but it's not really a file room. Um, and we feel that the, the agency is really in an inappropriate place for student academic records. Um, as I'm alluding to, we do not have a secure record storage facility. If um, we were to see any sort of environmental impacts, flood, water of any kind, fire, smoke, those records would be totally susceptible, and that's not common practice with long-term records retention. Usually you have some sort of climate control facility. Um, second, the agency doesn't have any staff who have it as part of their job description to work with these student academic records and retrieve them. With the Burlington College records, we do see um, periodic requests from students. I mean, those, the students are seeking other degrees, they're applying for jobs, that wasn't that long ago. Um, and that is agency staff time that's taken away to go in the file room and find whatever the student is seeking. These are not folks who've worked in a registrar's office, who are familiar with the way that transcripts appear, the information in transcripts. We're doing the best that we can. Um, and the agency staff who frequently get these calls told me they feel a great sense of urgency to go, they prioritize these requests really above anything else because they know that it's a student who's applying for a job or some other positive life experience. They don't want them to wait on agency staff um, to do that. So we take it really seriously. It's just not, it's not a good fit. Um, and then finally, the agency doesn't have authority and statute to charge fees for uh, access to transcripts as is really common. If you ever have to get your college transcript from your institution, it's, I think I paid $12 before to get my transcript. You sort of expect that, but the agency would um, not be able to charge that fee. We could follow the normal Public Records Act fee processing um, process, but that's nominal and we wouldn't do that to those students anyways. It's not the intent of that section of law. So the agency is suggesting that the, um, the state actually has an appropriate entity for student academic records. It's the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. They call it the SARA. Um, it, has a state-of-the-art climate control records facility that is that was built specifically to house records that goes along with staff who are trained in records administration and, and I assume whose full-time jobs are to work with those records. Um, VSARA has existing authority to charge a fee. I looked into it. I'll just show you. It, I think it's $9.50 if this will load. Yeah. They currently charge $9.50 for students to access records for these schools that are currently housed at VSA. <laughs> and those are all the Secretary of State's office? That is a division of the Secretary of State's office, yes. And I have to give you a disclaimer like Susan gave you. I've not had a chance to speak to anyone from the Secretary of State's office about this. Um, my understanding is that 
the State Archives and Records Administration stopped accepting student records at some time in the past, but no one at the agency is familiar with the exact background of that. You have to ask them if that's accurate. So, so has the agency approached them about the drone thing? Um, I'm a little hesitant to answer that. I know the agency did not think that we were an appropriate place for the Burlington College records. We sought other avenues to get the Burlington College records in a more appropriate place, and they're still at the Agency of Education. What happens if Prescott College closes? This statute gives the State Board authority and the Attorney <coughs> General, uh, in the worst cases, some authority over post-secondary institutions operating in Vermont. I don't believe Prescott College fits the definition of operating in Vermont under their teach-out agreement with Green Mountain College. So I, I think that it would be Arizona's jurisdiction. I'm not familiar with their statute. Any questions? So I've taken the absolute liberty right here of some language that um, we think accomplishes the goals that I lay out. I hope that you consider it. Um, the last sentence there that's totally new, um, we hope would cover the Burlington College record. Just want to be totally upfront about that. If, um, if the General Assembly passes a, a new process that does establish some other state agency as the custodian of last resort, if everything else just goes wrong, we think it would be entirely appropriate for Burlington College to go along to that, um, that institution. <coughs> questions so James so um, we don't we don't know yet whether Bisara feels like they have the capacity in the staff we do I have not asked that okay <clears throat> I have two questions one is one it would it not make sense to have colleges kind of have or for you to have a form for these colleges that if they get to a certain point in you know in their finances that it flags way before 90 days you know I mean I, I have to assume of an institution that size you're you probably know a year ahead that that things are you know not looking good I just wonder if there's a way just easy simple just that they let the agency know that yeah just something very simple like if they go below a certain level or meet certain criteria to flag that they need to let you know that in case you know just to give you a heads up that they're headed so that that's one question and the other question is can't these records be digitalized I mean wouldn't it make sense to have all colleges have records you know stored digitally instead of paper copies so that's an easier question to answer up front. Um, I believe that it's the absolute norm at this point for our colleges in Vermont to have digital transcripts. Um, my sense is that Burlington College's records were in a state of sort of, the, they were in the middle of working with some records um, at the time that everything happened. So I think maybe even some of the Burlington College records um, under their policies were digitized. Um, what we have is paper records at mm -hmm. the agency. So yes, I think in the future, there's a, I was gonna show you right here in the language, it's actually where these stars are. There's a provision that the, oh here it is, and to prepare their academic record is a duty of the closing institution. So essentially to get the records in their normal order and to be prepared to go wherever they're going is an affirmative duty in section 175. So we would hope so. The agency hasn't digitized the paper Burlington College records that we have for any number of reasons. We're, like we said, we're not experts in record maintenance and working with uh, transcripts. And my, my understanding is that sometimes students don't need the whole packet. Um, mm -hmm. So we've not made any sort of decisions about Burlington College or housing them, and we are responding to student requests and um, trying to not change the form of those records. We don't really feel like we have authority to do that. But can you insist that they're digitalized from this point on, that all records are digital? So the 
and this sort of answers your first question, the Agency of Education's relationship and the State Board of Education's relationship to post-secondary institutions isn't that close. Mm -hmm. We don't have really robust oversight. We're not seeking really robust oversight to, to give them directions such as digitize your records. Mm -hmm. So, And I'm not a post-secondary person, so I don't know what they would even think about that. Um, that's another reason why, to your first question, the agency might not be told by these institutions at the first sign of trouble. Um, we might informally, and they might um, give us the professional courtesy shirt, certainly of calling us earlier. I think that the, um, the language here about five days after probation from the accrediting agency is appropriate and is a pretty quick turnaround. I mean, you could play with the number of days, but that does seem prompt. And the Agency of Education doesn't have financial oversight in a way that would just let us know on our own that there's trouble. The system is really set up to uh, strongly utilize these accrediting bodies that are third party bodies. Thank you. Um, so the five days, I'm just worried about the five days. I feel like it's really quick. Um, because if they notify you, it doesn't become public. Is that public? Well, they could call us. Okay. Um, we would not. That's a harder question to ask if it would be public. And I, I see the concern. It's really sensitive because you do sort of trigger that um, spiral of like, hey, I'm, enrollment. I'm looking at this college and this college, and they're under this probation. I'm not going to that. You know what I'm saying? I wish I had the full stat. I wish I had my green book in front of me. Um, I don't know how much time you have. Yeah. I mean, it's really set. It's it's really tough because I don't know. I'm trying to think if it's on the radar or. Susan, when uh, an institution goes on probation, it does become public. Okay. Uh, so Netchi, it makes it public, uh, so it does become public. So um, the five days were about it. Just yeah, okay. so the five days is just to make sure the agency knows uh, in sufficient time. And normally an institution uh, is placed on probation for two years, so that's the notice, the advance notice, and that they have time uh, to work out the situation. That helps, thank you. So more of the oversight is actually coming from, from the board. Is that what you're also saying? So the state board has the authority to give um, certificates to institutions. It depends if you're chartered in Vermont or not. It's a little complex. But the sort of approval for any institution that's beginning business in Vermont is actually the state board's authority. Uh, that's just one of those things where this, the agency is doing the legwork to um, inform the state board of those instances. I'm going to want to probably get you back when we do markup on this. Um, I'm cognizant of the fact that we've got a two-hour meeting coming up, and I'd like to give us a little 10-minute uh, break and be in the chamber at one minute of <laughs> <laughs> to meet with the agency and on our uh, oversight of the agency and capacity. So we will be meeting with, thank you very much, thank Emily. You. Thank you. Yeah. We're clearly not finished. Great if you, you and Avit could meet, um, you know, just wherever. <laughs> 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 sort out those differences.